Hello, and thank you so much for having us for the Change Makers in Action and Change Makers in Circularity series. I'm Celine Saman, and I am honored to be with uh, my guests today, Dao Yi Chao and Dr. Thean Shiros. We're going to be discussing the one by one um, science incubator, the first science incubator in fashion. So the one by one was an initiative that we uh, conducted at the Slow Factory um, in partnership with the Shurovsky Foundation and the Shurovsky team, as well as supported by the United Nations Office for Partnership. The one by one was a um, the first science incubator in the fashion industry, pairing a scientist with a uh, designer and trying to work at the intersection of science and design building a common language to discuss certain issues together and really pushing science outside of the lab and pushing design outside of the fashion industry as we know it. So today we're going to be joined by the pair uh, working on the circularity uh, specifically in the fashion incubator, the science incubator, um, the team at Public School New York uh, with Dao Yi and Dr. Thean Shiros, who was the designer who was paired with the public school a New York team. And Maxwell, who unfortunately can't join us today. Yes, and Maxwell, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, but allow me to introduce you a little bit to the public school team. So the public school, as you know, uh, is a, a pair of designers between Dao Yi and Maxwell Osborne, uh, Dao Yi Chao and Maxwell Osborne. The pair have won two fashion prizes for their streetwear infused menswear. Uh, following their early success, they were tapped by Car Caroline Brown, the chief executive at Donna Karen International to take over as creative directors of the DKNY in 2015. As part of an effort to rebrand the iconic but amazing brand. During their tenure, Chow and Osborne oversaw both menswear and women's wear for the brand with their first collection debuting at New York Fashion Week in the last September. Is that true? Um, maybe not last September, but uh, a September. few Septembers ago. <laughs> September two thousand. Like time is so circular. Time is a warp right now. So. That time is a warp. Um, Thean, I uh, did you send me your? Oh yeah, and Dr. Thean Shiros. Uh, is a PhD of assistant professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology and a researcher and scientist at Columbia University. She is the co-founder and CSO of Wear Wool, developing biodegradable textile fibers with DNA program color and performance set. There's a typo here. <laughs> Dr. Thean Shears has served as the United Nations Eco West <clears throat> Economic Community of West African States Fellow for Sustainable Energy Engineering and the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority and an Energy Frontier Research Center. So Dr. Thean Shiros has been chosen because of her many accolades, but also specifically because of her work on uh, the nanocellulose um, leather alternative that she has developed. And we wanted to pair uh, Dr. Thean Shiros with the team at public school to explore what could a designer and a scientist do together if they were given the opportunity to work outside of uh, the, the, the fast paced fashion industry and be able to explore a collaboration together on a new material, but also on innovating with design and design patterns and using design as a medium for social and environmental change, which uh, the team at public school has been doing in so many different projects, including with <clears throat> Eileen Fisher Waste No More program that you guys were part of. So I'm so excited. Enough about all these introductions. Let's get to, um, to the discussion. So I would love to hear a little bit from you both, Thian and Dao, Dao Yi, if you can just, you know, talk a little bit about uh, in your own words about this this collaboration together. Take it away. Go ahead. Um, well, what we didn't know, I knew about public school and I was really excited because I really loved that um, it was so built in circularity. People are always looking for like a new sexy thing and really a lot of it is using what's there. Um, and that was, and then what we learned when we first met is we're both from Jackson Heights, um, which is, now you don't meet that many people. So um, 
for, for from my point of view, um, as soon as I went from our first, you know, kind of meeting, which was Zoom because of everything was distance, um, Dowie and Maxwell were right away like, it should be as much of one material as possible. You know, the, all their thinking was super, super like rooted in circularity, rooted in can this be biodegradable? So I think something that was really exciting for me was we took on this challenge of making um, a biodegradable pair of sneakers because sneakers are super hard. They've got so many different components. They've got glues and rubbers. And, and, um, and then the other idea, other aspect for me was how much they pushed the design aesthetic and what they saw in the material that I hadn't seen. So I, I was like a kid in a candy shop scientifically because I got this new set of challenges, um, but with through this lens of, you know, kind of them bringing the science to life and something really accessible. And Dawi, in your words, how was it when we presented you with this idea? I know you guys were very much interested in the science of it, of course, but also in the sustainability of the project. And because you guys have been exploring many different ways to how to be sustainable. So in your words, how was that collaboration, um, you know, explored on your end? Yeah, like, you know, our journey towards, you know, sort of just being more responsible and, and, Oh, you know, at ease with our collections and the products that we produce and introduce into um, into the world has led us on many different paths. And I think that this was a new path that we had not yet explored, which was, you know, the science behind, uh, you know, creating textile, creating raw material, uh, or developing raw material for, from a whole new sort of waste stream. You know, in the past we've done things around, you know, fabrics and textiles that had already been milled, um, or, you know, created from, you know, from recycled from, from old, uh, fabrics and textiles that had already been introduced into the world. But what was super interesting to us um, and to hear about Deanne and her work was, you know, creating something, you know, like really creating something, like growing something like, you know, sort of, we, we learned so much about, you know, nano fibers and, you know, cellular, uh, um, you know, cellular mm -hmm. factories cellular yeah. sneaker factories yes you know our our vocabulary and our iq instantly jumped 100 <laughs> percent um so the opportunity to actually work with the end uh and 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 literally watch this thing grow in front of our eyes um was i think sort of the not the last frontier for, certainly but like you know the next frontier for us to really push forward and and it was it was just so amazing um to I'm be so able excited to hear even more about it but just a little bit before just to give a context of what this material is about Thean, you had to grow something outside of the lab because of the coronavirus situation that we were all facing we were all in a pandemic and so how did you manage to do the work you typically do in a lab and tell us a little bit about the kind of challenges you had to face Okay, so these little guys on the screen, these are our, these were our nanofiber factories. These are our bioleather factories, these cells. So the living cell was our factory. Um, we, it was everything shut down, right, with COVID. Um, so I recreated a sterile lab environment, um, <laughs> one of the rooms downstairs. Um, and so um, maybe a little bit about the material and then what it what it took to make it. So what's really, I think, very exciting about this material, and I think something where Dowie and Max and I really kind of connected was, um, you know, if you're talking, there's organisms in nature, like, I, you've, Celine, you've heard me say this, like, microbes are the unsung heroes of biodiversity. I mean, they build materials up and other microbes can break them down. They're low energy, they're rapidly replenishing, and certain classes of microbes, actually, because they've existed in like the wild for forever, um, they've evolved to utilize a lot of different um, natural materials as food. 
And so because of that, we, I, this, there's a certain class of, of bacteria that as part of their metabolism take sugars um, and nitrogen they take sugars and they, they take sugar as like a, if you wanna, like it's a molecule that looks like this and then cellulose, plant cellulose is like, it's a chain of them. And so this little organism takes those sugars and goes and makes nanofibers. And those nanofibers can be turned into textile materials. But because they're, um, this has been used, this was discovered in 1850 in vinegar fermentation, the nanocellulose. Kombucha has been around since 2000 BC, Manchuria. This is the same kind of symbiotic colony that's used to ferment health probiotic beverages. So because of that, I was able to use kind of diverse uh, nutrient streams and not have to have these like really lab grade nutrient media. Right, um, you used like things that were around the house. So tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, so it has to, everything has to be really sterile because you, you don't want other things to compete. But um, we used tea, we used, I used tea after, I would save all my tea bags and then rerun it through to pull the nitrogen out. Um, we used table sugar, but also sugar from, you know, any kind of leftover juices or fruits, I would save it and pasteurize it and feed it to the bacteria. Um, part of it was just the exploration of it. Um, and so they, you could channel different. So my son would leave his, you know, apple cider out and that's always frustrating to me. So I put it in the microwave, um, uh, pasteurize it, feed it to the bacteria. Um, and then they would, if, I think if you, I think we have a little time-lapse of what these guys do. Um, so this is comparing different sugar sources, like how well <laughs> the cellulose grow. So the liquid is the food and on top is the nanocellulose. It floats to the top and you get this sheet. And because you get these sheets, um, once I got the pattern from Dowie and Max and we decided what we wanted to do, we grew it to the sheet. Um, so it's, it's also, also zero waste in production, which I think was really exciting for both of us that you can kind of grow, 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 a, pair, grow a pair of sneakers to shape. Um, and so we would, you know, played with vessels, etc. And so this is just kind of comparing two different sugar sources, um, one kind of table sugar and the other from waste streams. Um, and, that, and then you harvest that material on top and you can process it. Um, my research team um, between FIT and Columbia University has developed, we developed inspired by indigenous science, we apply traditional leather processing to develop a plant-based tanning. We'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah. I just wanna replay it and just get uh, Dawi's uh, input on it. So you guys, I'm sure you felt like there was so many layers of innovation, a layer of innovation from a material perspective, from a design and pattern perspective. I know you are all um, interested in sustainability, but it, particularly for this project, can you tell me a little bit the history of using fashion as a medium for social change, but also how was this project able to meet all these criteria for you guys? Yeah, at, I mean, at, at the at public school, you know, public school for us was has never been about just making clothes. Um, you know, we 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 knew that uh, early on that we wanted to be able to create platform, you know, for an exchange of ideas. You know, which is what public school in the real world is all about, um, you know, understanding that you could, you know, be commercial, but at, at the same time, not have to, you know, sacrifice your morals, uh, you know, or your values. So that was really important to us early on and obviously has stayed with us. So, you know, th this, this journey and this natural evolution of sorts to work towards um, you know, lessening our footprint and, and our harm on the world. I think every designer, if they haven't gotten there yet, will eventually get there yet. And it will eventually get there and need to get there soon. So, you know, being paired up uh, to work on this project fit, you know, specifically into our long range goals and plans. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the innovation for us was it took a while, I think, for us to really catch on to, to understand, you know, the science behind it. And Theanne was so lovely and, and uh, generous with her time to, you know, be able to let us slowly sort of catch on and use a different part of our brain, um, you know, to, to think about uh, this project and how we could, you know, uh, incorporate it into, you know, our future processes. So that I think was the, you know, the initial challenge of really 
just understanding what the innovation was. And then once we grasped that, you know, like we, we sort of had to parallel path understanding the science and then getting, um, uh, sorry, my screen just went black. Um, understanding the science and then also implementing that with our design process. Incredible, yes. Tian, tell us a little bit about this, uh, the process of explaining science. I know you've been always put in a position of tell us a little bit more, be the teacher of your own invention. And so you've had to do that several times for this program. But once again, please tell us what is this about? Oops, you're muted. I think. Well, it's more than a pleasure, right? I mean, it's, it's more than a pleasure. Um, so, I mean, on top, you kind of, the idea is that, um, I mean, when we talk about circularity, and innovation and circularity. There's there's a couple of different ways to do it, right? I mean, the one of the biggest impacts ways is the way that we and Max and public school have been doing it. I mean, you you reintegrate materials into the supply chain, into new products, and that I can tell you right now as a, as a kind of a disclaimer, um, we did you know we did the calculations for the reduction in environmental footprint compared to any new material, and and this one is much lower, but there there's no lower impact than the material that already exists. So I think I want to tip the hat that this innovation, I was so excited that they welcomed it because um, people do get really excited about new materials, but I think we all have to keep in mind that there's tons of materials out there and all our material, a, a future of fashion that's circular and a future of materials that's circular is either that, you know, they're, they're, re they're designed at the beginning to be reintegrated at the end of their useful life, or they're built up by rapidly renewable organisms like the microbes, and then at the and they're processed in a way that there's nothing toxic, there's there's nothing that compromises their biodegradability, and then at the end of their useful life, they can be broken down uh, by other microorganisms to provide nutrients for the next generation of materials, which can then feed the microbes to make more materials. So both are both are paths to circularity. I think, um, and so the material here that we, we talked about, it's this the nanocellulose sheets and it grows. It's also kind of amazing. Like you just, you're growing something to shape. And then with the trick for this material is all these biomaterials, even cowhide, um, unprocessed biomaterials can get brittle. Um, they're, they exchange water really easily. Um, you know, so the mycelium leather, the cactus leather, much like cow leather, if they're unprocessed, you know, cow leather needs to be tanned. It can be a vegetable tanned, which is great, but it's not. It's generally chrome tanned, which is really toxic. But a lot of the exciting new biomaterials, um, which like are always inspiring, to get them to be durable, um, they kind of have coatings or plasticizers that render compromise their biodegradability and render and introduce toxicity. So that was a parameter space. So um, by using natural dyes in a green chemistry process. Um, of a plant tanning mechanism, we were able to have the effect of what a plasticizer does, which is rearrange the bond so it's strong and flexible, um, and then work with it. We were, because we were so, so what you can see here on the left is, is sort of the drying the leather. I mean, we used really traditional wet leather drying and, and tanning, you know, adapted. Um, but a lot of those techniques, and what you see here is um, um, for natural color, one thing is that um, the public school aesthetic, you know, it's, we, they wanted to go for like a white and a black, um, but every time you change the color, you know, when you introduce color, you can change the fibers, right? It's, it's you know, you're, you're changing things. And so natural black is actually a really big challenge, which I found to be one, I mean, so many things were exciting about this project, but the getting natural black that was, had a good ductility and strength and a good hand feel was actually a huge challenge. Um, and we accomplished it with two ways. We used really ancient historical dyes like myrobalan and the bark of an acacia tree. And I collected the, some rusty nails and I made an iron bath to dip it in, which darkens the colors. And then we also used um, a fresh soy milk as a binder for indigo pigment. Um, so a lot of this, I think that was special was it, it also was an acknowledgement of all like the, the millennia of, of so, textile science and cultural heritage that should be, I, I think is found an opportunity to really celebrate that 
and also kind of integrate that in a way that's appropriate and respectful um, and kind of not, not at all like sort of extractive. Um, and so we put all that together and um, at the end, be both because we ran out of materials and because we're the ultimate like goal of zero wasting, I actually was able to work with a local kombucha brewery. So, you know, you're working, having a lab at home, it's COVID, you're homeschooling, everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong all the time. We had, I felt so bad. I have so many messages to Dawi and Max being like, it looked good, it all, I left it and I left it out. Like I went to get at my kid somewhere and it got moldy because it wasn't full, you know, stu like really bad. Like, how am I even gonna tell them this? But I wound, we wound up working with um, a kombucha brewery and all the kombucha breweries I found have a SCOBY hotel, which is like these huge nanocellular sheets that are still, they, they, they have live and active cultures, but you can process them. And something super cool, and I think I'm curious to hear about Dawi's reaction to this, because we, we were so busy by the end making it happen. We didn't really get to mash up on that much. On yeah, how and I want to get to Dawi's most inspiring moments too. Maybe we can jump to Dawi on that point but scoby yeah. hotel that sounds incredible i, I want to just so we what we did was we actually to make it grow to shape since we hadn't grown it but we wanted it to be to shape we actually turned it into a slurry and then cast the slurry into the pattern and so something that kind of i still think blows my mind and i'm curious about dowie your reaction and celine i mean you can't pour you can't take a t-shirt put it in a blender pour it and make a t-shirt again but with this material because they're nanofibers you can right you, you make a slurry you pour it you recast it and that really allowed us to stay true to this minimal waste throughout. Um, but I want to pass it to Dawi. So we, this is so what we incredible. I'm so excited to hear Dawi from your perspective. I'm sure there were many uh, awe-inspiring moments. But if you can share some of them with us, like from a design perspective, from the way that you discovered this material, like every uh, moment was a discovery, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, lots of mind blowing uh, moments for sure, and you you know like you 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 have you have to uh, you have to think about like you know my entire career Max's entire career you know we've we've approached design and product design uh, you know fashion design you know through a really specific lens. I'm not talking about our aesthetic, but just you know like the the the, the ABCs to, you know, like building a product, right? You identify, you know, color and textile, you know, you sketch something out and you get the pattern made and you, you know, get the, the, the roll of fabric and you cut the fabric and you sew it. And, you know, hopefully someone keeps it for a long time. Maybe they throw it out, uh, you know, or, you know, donate it or, but it winds up in the landfill and then you start all over again. And so we, we had to completely rewire the way that we thought about um, designing this product. You know, as the end discussed earlier, sort of the circularity, um, you know, of the entire process of taking raw materials, building a product that breaks down again, that enriches and provides for new raw materials to, to, to you know, to build, you know, another product again, like that's, you know, mind blowing and, and you, you know, like, of course we've known about circularity and in, in the process, but to actually, you know, witness it and partake in the process is, 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 is a complete mind, you know, fuck, sorry for cursing. And oh, um, totally. it's true because it's so far, far from what we are, you know, interfacing yes. with. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, like, you know, it's like a complete different journey, right? And so that in and of itself was mind blowing. But then, you know, all the different things, you know, like being able to grow the textile to the shape, to the pattern, right? Like, so when Theanne talks about growing, you know, the, the nanofiber to the pattern, so, you know, like each piece, you know, has a pattern that's the side of the, the um, you know, the quarter of the, um, uh, of the upper of the sneaker, you have to, you have to, you know, normally you would have to cut, you, you draw the shape, you place that piece of paper or that pattern on top of a big, large skin, and you cut around it, and you cut the shape out, and then the rest of the skin 
hopefully you could you know cut other pattern pieces or they get thrown out but here you're growing you're literally growing the textile to the shape there's zero waste and so that uh that concept and that idea is mind-blowing in and of itself like you, you don't have to cut anything you don't have to worry about um you know wasting mm -hmm. right any waste you don't have to worry about um you know like pattern efficiency and and markers and making sure that you know all the patterns work together so you get the maximum yield out of the out of the skin or the textile no you're growing not only are you just growing it to shape but that's it you're not making any more than you need you're not wasting anything and so that's completely mind-blowing and then the second part was sort of like achieving these colors like when you think about black you're like oh yeah you know like everything is black my t-shirt my hat you know but you don't ever think about the process and the and sort of the uh, the, the 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 chemicals and the, the ingredients that go into trying to create that color, and for you know Deanne and her team to sort of come up with these uh, processes that date back to you know 200 BC, uh, you know like of of extracting color from nature. Like we're not making the color up if it's not in nature. Like the color doesn't exist, and so for us to you know like get the the uh, the nanofibers to 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 read black you know like to read like a really true black um was an accomplishment you know it's like you never think about that you just like oh, you know, you just send it's it out so to the dye lot and have it lab dipped and it'll be the same color we want so yeah just some you know those two things i think really um little things that you know from from the outside looking in but as a designer, like if, if you understand the process, the old process, these new processes, you know, should, you know, sort of just sit you on your ass and like make you consider everything you ever knew. <laughs> I love that. So Thian, it, it brings me to um, the, uh, the, the, our last question for you. Um, how can science push uh design in your opinion well i mean science and design can push each other yes well the question would be yeah, so i think design uh, actually the question is how how did design the design of the shoe the design constraints that you had to work with how did that push science outside of of the the the, the regular you know research yeah. that you had i mean Not i'm humbled regular, by this something I'm regular sure. yeah but go I, on. I was like schooled by public school in the best possible way, because like what Dawi hasn't mentioned is that together with Max, we, the material you see here, the sneaker, every part of it except the cork sole is based on the, the nanocellulose mesh. Every single part of it, it's all naturally dyed, every single part of it. But the textures and patterns you see here, I had never created. To my knowledge, they have not been created. So public school actually co-developed, I mean, they not only did the design and, and kind of, but they, the material, they pushed the material development in a very kind of scientific way. Um, so I think like designers were more of a scientist than, you know, I was at all like involved in design. It designed, so we've done all the lab tests. We developed this material, you know, we do all the like kind of classic, like you test the strength, you test the flexibility, you test the water resistance. But that's not hand feel, that's not look, that's not vibe, that's not texture, right? That's not like, how does this actually work together? Like, I never thought about making laces out of it, right? Every single part of the shoe with its different strengths and material requirements we made out of the cellulose because Max and Dowie were so open-minded and so insanely clever about seeing aspects of the material that could be exploited. And I would meet with them and just kind of go back to the lab and try a bunch of things. And then we'd meet like Rogue, Renegade, wherever in Brooklyn we could meet outside safely. And I'd show them the materials and they always saw something I didn't see. Um, so I think science can push design because I, I think it's honestly innovating and sustainability is all about dismantling perceived stereotypes and silos. It's just about like, can we get together with a goal? Everybody has a different perspective. Nobody does anything alone. And the more people we can bring in um, and the more solidarity there is, 
the more we're going to innovate. So I don't actually see science, like, you know, I really see it like as holding hands in a really, this was, this was like, this is like a love letter to the like nature, to like community and to me and to like, just the power of collaboration and community and being, um, I was blown away by not only the cleverness, but the open-mindedness to kind of take that science and turn it into a design. So I would say, you know, it's wonderful that the material, like I think I, it makes me so happy that the material and, and the new thinking was exciting for them, but I would say, I had the same rewards out of it and opening expansion of my perspective. Um, so I think that brings me to a question for you, Celine, if I may. Oh, um, I because what we haven't done is congratulate Celine on the first ever science fashion incubator, which is quite a feat, not easy to pull off, not easy to pull off in COVID. Um, and I mean, you know, we had three beautiful teams, like Charlotte McCurdy, Philip Lim, uh, Custom collaboration, Nora Hoffman. Um, so I, I wanted to tell, say congratulations and, and thank you for giving us this opportunity and everyone this opportunity to see what can happen. Um, and I wonder for you, you know, what came out of it new for you? You know, what was your moment of awe? And, you know, I wonder how, like, you have this vision, right? And then you brought it to life. And I wonder um, what surprised you about the outcomes. This is uh, very beautiful. Thank you so much. I was not expecting to be uh, speaking. I was actually going to extend the same question back to Dawi, but we'll get back to that. Uh, you know, it was not an easy uh, project, <laughs> you know, because we are trying to, as you said, break many silos at the same time, you know, the silo between science and design, but also between um, non for profit and the private sector in the fashion industry and working across sectors. So it was multi multiple uh, challenges that we had to face in order to bring this project to life. And, you know, it was COVID-19. We didn't expect to be launching something like this in one of the most challenging years we've ever seen in our, you uh, know, so far, you know. So um, the, the kind of challenges that we faced were definitely to have to adapt to everything going remote. That was a challenge for all of us uh, to make sure that the teams were, were not pressuring our teams more than necessary because everybody was going through uh, their own sets of, uh, of constraints given the, the pandemic, given the economic pressures that they were facing. I think the documentary that we managed to create together really speaks to that and I would encourage everyone to um, if they haven't seen it yet to go to one x one dot earth and to watch the documentary that we managed to <laughs> to put together that really puts this um, into perspective you know the first science incubator in fashion that's now on hold on standby as we are fundraising to continue this project uh, continue this innovation but also it's so important because as we saw in the first year of this incubator, the pilot program, uh, we saw that, that there is a need to uh, break down these barriers between science and design, not just to innovate and to create new products, but to also keep the inspiration going because through COVID-19, I saw and, and heard a lot of the designers around us were facing a sort of like, um, uh, blank page syndrome, you know, when you're like, you're unable to create, there's so many constraints and you're just uninspired. And I think that the one by one was able to at least keep us inspired and keep us, uh, keep the creativity going, um, keep us challenged, keep us on track because, because of the COVID-19 and the pandemic that we all faced, it was very, very um, hard to to just find inspiration and to find motivation. And that was something that my team has faced and something that I've heard from several teams that we that were part of the one by one. But because we kept each other going, it was kind of like a community in and of itself. It, we kept each other going. <laughs> we really wanted to hit those, uh, those, those finish line, even though it was hard. And I know, Tian, so many texts that I've received from you where I was like, what am I doing? Why am I putting so much pressure on these individuals? <laughs> but in the end, we are so proud and it has pushed design further. It has pushed science further. And those are the types of collaborations that the fashion industry needs first and foremost. And what I discovered also through this program is that 
I thought it was going to be easy. Like just put designers and scientists together, give them money and let them roll with it. But what I realized is that, oh my gosh, this is a first, there needs to be a shared language a shared language between science and design. It's something that we didn't anticipate that we found that we um, needed to put more time and effort into because there wasn't any uh, chance for the two to kind of come together outside of the pressure of producing in fashion or the pressure of creating something that has a capital gain we were able to develop a common language together and I, I am excited to see hopefully another year of the one by one and another year and another year to continue developing this shared language that we are exploring together. That's the innovation for me, is how do we, as we break down these silos, create a shared language that becomes easier for scientists and designers to work together. I am fundraising for the next year. I'm trying not to, to be you know, that desperate about it because it's very hard post COVID to fundraise for a project like this. Um, I'm very much hopeful that we manage to get the funds to continue this important initiative because science and design coming together, that's how we change the world, you know, that's how we bring innovation forward, that's how we um, create something climate positive. So that's my challenge right now. But I want to turn it back to Dawi and I would love to hear from you about what were the, how did the science push design how did it push your design thinking because I know you guys were already exploring you know alternative design thinking and you were working with like other innovators so I want to hear from you how science can push design um science can push design by simply introducing a new way of thinking and you know I, I talked about it a little bit before is like most designers are trained you know, to think one way, to think about product one way. Um, and maybe there's been a move for designers and brands to, um, you know, work on more green product. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it's still more product, right? And so the goal isn't to make more green product. The goal is to, um, you know, to really dismantle, I think someone used that word today, um, you know, the old way of thinking about how to, you know, like about, you know, product and design and also consumption, right? Um, and, and so science introduces sort of these new paths for you to, to, to think because it has to start in here. It has to start, you know, inside you to, uh, to be able to then, you know, plot it out. Just like I was describing how, you know, when we initially linked up with Deanne, like we, we had to slowly work it out in our mind. And so, you know, if it were not for that innovation uh, that science provided, if it were not for introducing new way streams and, um, you know, the idea of circularity, the possibility of circularity, then you'll still be stuck in, a, you know, in the route of thinking you're doing better by just making green products. Certainly that that's a step forward, but, you know, again, we got to push beyond and scratch beneath the surface. So I think that the um, science really just helps to rewire the way you think. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's what definitely uh, motivated us at Slow Factory to imagine a program like this and to really try to create a, a safe space, if you will, or like an environment for collaboration, because collaboration oftentimes is for, you know, the hype or the, the, the culture, let's say, not necessarily for the um, purpose of, of pushing science forward or scientific discovery. And I know that this material, the first time that Diane showed it to me and talked to me about it, I fell off my chair. I was like, oh my God, this needs to be something major. And so that's, I would say that the one by one initiative was inspired by Thian's work. And it, she was the first person I called being like, do you want to be part of this? So um, it's very cool to see it come to life and to imagine the future of one by one and to hopefully see it come to life post COVID. So thank you both so much. Any last words of uh, wisdom that you would like to share? 
No, but I mean, I just want to thank you, Celine, for continuing to, you know, push forward and putting pressure on yourself to do, <laughs> to do more. I think that this, uh, you know, again, I think the next step uh, is to be trying to figure out how to, um, you know, take this and be able to scale it in a, in a meaningful way. Because, uh, you know, that will be what tears down sort of the old ways within our industries when we can figure out how the science works um, with the business of it all. And ultimately it, it is a business and, uh, you know, to, to again, to, to just make more green product is not the solution. We have to challenge the way that we think and we, and we also have to challenge the way that, you know, people consume and think about consumption. And I think that these are all ways um, you know, all, all paths to, uh, to, to being able to do that, to accomplish that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for seeing that. I think that the Seal Factory Foundation is very much interested in all these issues that collide. For instance, what you just said about the business viability of a product like this, that's something that we're very interested in at the moment. Um, we're interested in scaling uh, innovations, of course, and we're interested to, to looking at it from different angles and different scales. So this for us was like an important first step, an important first a piece in the puzzle of scaling something. So mm -hmm. oftentimes when we're talking about scaling, people imagine something going big overnight, you know, but scaling takes multiple small steps in order for us to slowly but surely uh, get to the right scale in a most sustainable way. So the one by one initiative is an important uh, milestone before we go to a bigger scale. So Oftentimes we look at an innovation like this and we're like, well, how much does it cost? Is it ready for the market? And its, it's success is measured whether or not it's commercial immediately. But for it to be commercial, it needs to have that kind of chance to being prototyped in that way, to being received by the public in that manner, for it to continue its journey into scaling further. So I, I think it's uh, an ecosystem, right? Like it's like a step-by-step -step ecosystem in order to see something like this scale. Um, and for Charlotte McCurdy's innovation as well for the bio um, sequence that they created, uh, it was also an important step because it wouldn't have come to life if they didn't meet because she was making like a, um, raincoats with that material, you know, and so Philip and Charlotte came together and it pushed it further, you know, I, I think that's an important step that often is being, uh, uh, you know, not taken seriously or not explored enough because in our society, small is insignificant, but in slow factory, small is beautiful, like the book uh, small is beautiful. Uh, small and slow is beautiful for us because that is an important foundational piece to yeah. grow it, to grow it further than we can imagine. Celine, it makes me think um, a lot of drops make a wave. Yes. Um, maybe we were a drop. Um, and, and for that, I, I wanted to say that I was so honored to have been included in this program. I'm so grateful um, for to both of you and Max for the generosity of spirit, of thoughtfulness, of knowledge. Um, it, I learned so much. And as, as an insatiably curious person who just wants to live a life of continued learning, I, am, I have a huge debt of gratitude. Um, I think that something that was moved me so much about this project was I always think about materials and systems and energy in symbiosis with nature, you know, like you said, an ecosystem. And I think that like this kind of maps that symbiosis between two communities. I mean, this was this, these sneakers were a total symbiosis of like design and science thinking. It wouldn't have happened without this synergy and the symbiosis of, of and, and, the, and the generosity and openness of coming to this space to become a drop in a wave maybe. At best, but, um, and so shout out to Alan too, because when we first met with Alan from the public school team, he was like, got it right away. He really imagined the possibilities and that gave us so much hope because when we, in, in, in trying to create this bridge between science and design, you wouldn't know this, but there are so many cultural barriers to even being part of this 
to being open enough to working on something like this, to being open to imagine what this could do and to give yourself the leap of faith to try it and to, to, to get your hands dirty and to get to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, people resist what they don't know and what they're uncomfortable with, which is hugely problematic in, in all areas. So I think that that openness um, and that meeting with like an open mind of saying like, what, what can I learn and what can I offer? It was like, it was a beautiful part of this project. Also like, I, I can't believe something we were working on turned into this. So thank you for, for you know, taking science and making this out of science. I just hope that the sneaker gets to be, um, you know, preserved in a museum um, because it was an important milestone in our uh, civilization to really bridge. I know we are talking about this experiment, but this experiment is an important link to, to whatever is going to come afterwards. So I'm really grateful that you guys did this and so proud of you and so grateful for this program, even if it's one year and this is what we've done, I'm proud. And I hope because I want more for it. I hope it sees another year and another year after that. So thank you so much. Thank you to FIT uh, yeah. for the trust. Thank you both. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, this is uh, this will air with the conference um, uh, near approaching Earth Day. Um, so any any for all the viewers watching, um, please, because we had to pre-record given everything being remote, please send any questions you have. Um, is it, do you have a public school general? It, I'm, you can reach me, Theanne underscore Shiros at FIT. You guys, most of you know that. Um, Dowie, is there kind of a, in, for any inquiries or interest yeah. students? We have a lot of interns and such that get very excited about circularity. Yeah. Um, we can, um, you guys can email principal at public school NYC. So principal, P A L, um, at public school NYC. All right. And you can email info at slowfactory.com. So All right. So now you know how to find us. Sorry we couldn't see you in 3D. Um, thanks to you both. Thanks for having us, Celine. Thank you so much, both. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Bye. Peace.